medical emergencies in dental practice, office preparation and managing the unconscious patient. With Dr. Morton Rosenberg, Associate Professor of Anesthesia and Clinical Professor of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Tufts University Schools of Medicine and Dental Medicine, and Dr. John Yagella, Professor of Oral Biology and Professor of Anesthesiology, UCLA Schools of Dentistry and Medicine. Every dentist can expect to be confronted by one or more major medical emergencies during the course of practice. Although minor, non-life-threatening emergencies occur with some frequency, the dental office must also be prepared to treat the potentially catastrophic one. Over the course of this video, we'll review with you the types of medical emergencies that can occur in dental practice, the reasons behind their increasing incidence, and the importance of patient history, staff training, and office preparation in preventing and responding to emergency situations. Finally, we will demonstrate management of the unconscious patient. With adequate training and preparation, it is possible to treat the inevitable office emergency in a calm, capable manner with optimal patient results. The incidence of medical emergencies in dentistry as a whole is increasing. Reasons include the following. First, aging of the general population. With the increasing age of the general population, the likelihood of encountering a medical emergency as a result of the physiologic and pathologic changes associated with the aging process also increases. Second, impact of medical advances. Advances in the diagnosis and management of many medical conditions formerly refractory to treatment have increased the number and severity of medically compromised patients seeking comprehensive dental treatment. Dental advances such as implants and complex periodontal treatment, combined with extensive restorative dentistry, are bringing more elderly and compromised patients into the dental environment. Third, pharmacologic considerations. Therapeutic choices for dentists are constantly increasing with the introduction of new drugs, each of which has its own unique mix of indications, contraindications, adverse effects, and drug interactions. Many dental patients also premedicate themselves with analgesics or central nervous system depressants that may cause adverse effects of their own or interact with drugs administered during dental therapy. And finally, stress. Many chronic medical conditions can escalate to acute medical emergencies when exacerbated by the stress of a dental appointment. The majority of medical emergencies in dentistry occurred during the administration of local anesthesia or with invasive dental procedures such as extraction and pulp extirpation. They are also more likely when local anesthesia is ineffective. Although anticipation of medical emergencies in the dental office is patient-centered, emergencies may also happen to dental personnel, other persons in the dental office, and people outside of the office. It is possible for just about any medical emergency to occur during the course of dental treatment. Common medical emergencies include syncope, hyperventilation syndrome, other psychogenic reactions, seizures, orthostatic hypotension, and mild self-limiting allergic reactions. Less frequent but potentially more devastating major emergencies that can occur include acute asthma, airway obstruction, acute heart failure, angina pectoris, myocardial infarction, cardiac arrest, stroke, anaphylaxis, drug overdose, and hypoglycemia. A combination of proper patient evaluation, adequate training of the dentist and staff, and appropriate selection of emergency drugs and equipment all play a role in ensuring effective responses to emergency situations. I see from your health history that you have a heart murmur. Yes. Has your physician commented upon that? Yes, he's told me I have a mitral valve prolapse. Has he expressed a need for antibiotics prior to dental therapy? Yes. That's very good. What we'll do now is take a blood pressure. Preoperative evaluation includes use of a medical history questionnaire, an oral history follow-up, a physical examination and review of systems obtaining of vital signs and, when appropriate, laboratory tests and consultations.
The assessment of physical status should help determine the risk-benefit ratio of an anticipated procedure, which drugs to avoid, the initial diagnosis of any medical emergency that may arise, and the management plan best suited for a particular patient. Let's practice one of our emergency drills today. Let's pretend this patient is having an asthmatic attack. Ingrid, get the oxygen. Daryl, get the emergency kit. It is imperative to develop a team approach to the handling of medical emergencies in the dental office, with each staff member responsible for a dedicated role. Cross-training is also vital to ensure an effective response should any member be unavailable. Only constant review and practice will keep the team sharp. Regular continuing education in medical emergencies and pharmacology, periodic training in basic life support, BLS, and in some offices, advanced cardiac life support, ACLS, combined with emergency drills, are the best way to prepare for emergencies. Although many medical emergencies can be properly treated without the use of drugs, every dental office must contain an emergency drug kit suited to the training of the individual dentist, the type of patient routinely treated, and the drugs administered during dental treatment. The correct approach for the use of drugs in any medical emergency should be essentially supportive and conservative. There is a general tendency to over-equip basic dental emergency kits with drugs that are beyond the needs and expertise of many general dentists. As a rule, the drugs placed in an office emergency kit should only include those familiar to the dentist. There are certain drugs that all dentists must keep readily available for immediate use. Dentists must know automatically when and how to give these specific agents for acute and possibly life-threatening situations. Oxygen is a primary, if not the primary, emergency drug indicated in any medical emergency where hypoxemia may be present. If clinically indicated, oxygen should never be withheld during any medical emergency. Every dental office should have a portable source of oxygen, an e-cylinder, that can be easily brought to any area of the office. Oxygen can be delivered to the spontaneously breathing patient via a full face mask, nasal cannula, or nasal hood. Dental offices must also have the capacity to deliver oxygen by positive pressure. This may be accomplished with a mouth-to-mask system equipped with an oxygen inlet to deliver oxygen-enriched air. Alternatively, a bag valve mask device consisting of a mask, self-inflating bag, and non-rebreathing valve may be used. Experience is required to use the bag valve mask effectively, especially in the large adult. Manually triggered oxygen-powered breathing devices consisting of a mask connected by high-pressure tubing to the oxygen supply with a valve activated by a control button on the mask may also be used. However, overinflation of the patient may force air into the stomach, and this device is not recommended for children. Epinephrine is the drug of choice for management of cardiovascular and respiratory manifestations of acute allergic reactions. For the effective treatment of anaphylaxis, epinephrine must be administered as soon as the condition is diagnosed. The drug should be available in a pre-loaded syringe for immediate use. Epinephrine can be injected subcutaneously or intramuscularly, 0.3 to 0.5 milliliters of a 1 to 1,000 solution. The intravenous route is also useful, but may induce or exacerbate ventricular ectopy and requires a 1 to 10,000 concentration. Because of its profound bronchodilating effects, epinephrine is also indicated for treatment of acute asthmatic attacks unrelieved by inhaled adrenergic drugs. Lastly, epinephrine is used during cardiac arrest because of its ability to elevate coronary perfusion during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Nitroglycerin, a rapidly acting vasodilator, is the treatment of choice for an acute attack of angina pectoris. It is available as a sublingual tablet or spray. Nitroglycerin tablets decompose when exposed to light and air. Thus, nitroglycerin spray with its long shelf life is an excellent option. One sublingual tablet or lingual spray, 0.4 milligrams, is given initially. Relief should occur within several minutes. In patients with a known history of angina,
This dose may be repeated twice at five minute intervals. If discomfort is not relieved, the diagnosis of evolving myocardial infarction must be entertained. In addition to the primary drugs, other drugs are useful in treating emergencies. They include an anticonvulsant for seizures, an antihistamine and a corticosteroid for allergic reactions, an adrenergic inhaler for acute asthma, aromatic ammonia for syncope, and glucose preparations for acute hypoglycemia. In addition to oxygen and ancillary equipment to deliver positive pressure ventilation, other emergency equipment includes adequate suction to remove material from the hypopharynx, tonsil suction tips, syringes and needles for parental drug administration, and a tourniquet for intravenous drug administration. Sudden loss of consciousness is perhaps the most striking emergency that can occur in the dental office. Usually a manifestation of simple syncope in response to the acute stress of a dental procedure, unconsciousness may also be caused by more serious events, even cardiac arrest. A standard approach to all emergencies helps ensure that essential steps in patient evaluation and management are not overlooked. This algorithm involves recognition, recognizing the emergency and establishing the level of consciousness, position, positioning the patient appropriately, airway, establishing a patent airway, breathing, assessing ventilation and supporting it as necessary, circulation, monitoring the patient's cardiovascular status and, if needed, providing chest compressions, and definitive therapy, initiating definitive therapy based on differential diagnosis of the patient's problem. Okay, turn your head toward me and open wide. Thank you. Close. Just stay right there. The patient, a 55-year-old man, is receiving dental care for the first time in 15 years. His medical history was negative, except for mitral valve prolapse, for which he has received antibiotic prophylaxis. His blood pressure was 154 over 94, and his heart rate 82. Jim, the topical anesthetic has had a chance to take effect now, so I'm going to lay you back in your chair a little bit and we'll get started. That stuff sure got everywhere. Is my tongue supposed to be numb? It's an effective medication. It's also getting cold in here. Could you please turn up the heat? Sure. As soon as we're finished with the local anesthetic, okay? Okay. Okay. I'm going to lay you back in your chair a little bit. Have a local, please. Jim, turn your head to me as far as you can. Open wide. Okay. Thank you. Jim? Jim? He's fainted. Have me rebreathe the oxygen. Jim? 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 Daryl, I need your help. He's having a seizure. Daryl, grab his arms. Give me the oxygen. Jim, Jim, open your eyes. You fainted. You're doing fine. Let's take a blood pressure. Just relax. We're going to keep you in a chair here. You're recovered. Take it easy. You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to put this mask on. Just relax. You're doing fine. You're doing great. Mm. Okay, Jim, you had a little faint. You're doing fine, okay? Just relax. Mm -hmm. You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, just relax. Good job. You're doing fine. I'm just going to sit you here for a while until you recover. Let us now review in sequence the chain of responses to this sudden loss of consciousness. Upon initial recognition that the patient is experiencing an emergency,
the procedure is halted and the level of consciousness ascertained. Once unconsciousness is diagnosed, the patient is placed in the supine position with the legs slightly elevated. This position promotes cerebral circulation and facilitates resuscitative care. Particularly in the supine position, the unconscious patient may lose their airway. Gravity and flaccid muscles may cause the tongue to occlude the posterior pharynx. Extending the head and thrusting the mandible forward normally relieves airway obstruction in the unconscious patient. Breathing is immediately checked after any maneuver to open the airway. Ventilations are detected by looking for chest movements, hearing breath sounds, and feeling the passage of air during expirations. Should no ventilatory efforts be detected, rescue breathing must be initiated. For the dentist not specifically trained in the use of the bag valve mask or oxygen-powered resuscitator, a mouth-to-mask device should be used. The one-way valve on the mask protects the dental staff member against microbial exposure, and the patient is more likely to be adequately ventilated. With the oxygen regulator set to deliver a minimum of 10 liters per minute, two slow breaths are initially given, and then a single breath every five seconds thereafter. If the unconscious patient is breathing spontaneously, oxygen should still be delivered to minimize the risk of hypoxemia. A simple face mask or nasal cannula may be used to minimize inspiratory effort. The circulatory status of the patient must be quickly evaluated. Initially, palpation of a carotid pulse can detect the heartbeat and yield information regarding its rate and rhythm, and some qualitative sense of the circulation. A blood pressure should be taken as soon as is practical. Repeated heart rate and blood pressure determinations should be made and recorded until the patient returns to baseline. Failure to detect a pulse mandates chest compressions at a rate of 80 to 100 compressions per minute, interposed with a single rescue breath every five compressions for two-person CPR. If single-person CPR is performed, the compression to breath ratio is 15 to 2. Definitive therapy, based on the patient's vital signs and a quick differential diagnosis of the emergency, can be considered after the preceding steps have been taken. In the case of a simple faint, proper positioning and oxygen supplementation may be all that is required to treat the patient. For other sinkable patients, brief inhalations of aromatic spirits of ammonia will assist the return to consciousness. Activation of emergency medical services is often indicated in patients who do not quickly regain consciousness and must immediately follow the diagnosis of cardiac arrest. A final lesson from the case demonstration is that a simple emergency may evolve slowly or change quickly into a more complex or dangerous situation. Here, grand mal seizures caused by cerebral hypoxia developed after a stress-induced faint. When a new emergency situation is recognized, the dental team must repeat the emergency algorithm sequence. Thus, positioning the convulsing patient to prevent injury immediately follows recognition of the seizure. In turn, ensuring an adequate airway, breathing, and circulation must quickly follow to detect and treat any change in these vital areas. Only after these steps are taken should definitive therapy be considered. You fainted. You're doing fine. Let's take a blood pressure. Medical emergencies can be expected during the course of routine dental treatment, especially in patients with pre-existing chronic medical conditions. It is our professional responsibility to have both necessary equipment and requisite training to successfully manage emergencies in the dental office. <laughs>